So, Charlie, welcome to the show. I haven't actually had a productivity person on in 180 episodes, I don't think. I think you might be the first. But looking through your content, there seems to be one general theme, and that is managing overwhelm. Mm -hmm. And the first question I have for you is, what is the overwhelm paradox? It's a good question. And I think, so the first thing that I get coaches to think about with overwhelm is there's two different types of overwhelm is how I explain it to people is um, there is existential overwhelm and cognitive overwhelm so existential overwhelm is kind of like the big picture who do I want to be where do I want to get to what are like my values ideals like that kind of dream life type stuff and then cognitive overwhelm is kind of like the the really busy brain like 100 miles per hour all of the time um, like your brain's got the engine of a Ferrari, the brakes of a milk float, like it does not stop. Um, so, and often those two things can kind of influence each other. And in that if we don't know what the big picture is or where we want to, where we want to get to, it's impossible to be productive because how can I prioritize a task when I don't know what outcome I'm trying to prioritize for? So that makes it really difficult. And then the, it works the other way as well. And that if we are not, um, being productive we procrastinate a lot we don't get anything done we stay stuck and we move further away from that dream life that we maybe have so they kind of both influence each other um the kind of overwhelm paradox is overwhelm is very much about being stuck in this moment so it's the inability to think further ahead than i just need to survive today and what coaches will normally do is they'll feel really overwhelmed they don't like that feeling they will do something very short term to try and get out of it. So typical ones are like, I'm going to rewrite my to-do list for the thousandth time today. I'm going to write everything on the whiteboard like <laughs> that is behind you there. Um, I'm going to start a new Notion page and stuff like that. The thing is, they're kind of short term solutions, quote unquote solutions, um, that don't actually reduce overwhelm. And all that does is you're left with the same amount of work because you've not done any work. You've just done lots of busy things to feel like work. And so now you are left with the same amount of work and the same amount of overwhelm, but slightly further behind because you've lost the time that you spent pissing around trying to do all the short stuff. And that makes you feel overwhelmed because you're like, oh, now I've got even less time to do all of these tasks that I need to do. Mm. And then you start the cycle again. I'm very overwhelmed. Let's write a to-do list to try and get everything down. Oh no, that's wasted more time. Things to do, overwhelm, etc. Do you think the sort of the existential overwhelm you mentioned, sort of like people not having a big picture? Do you see mm -hmm. more people lacking where the end goal is, or do you think find that people often know where the end goal? Because I think this is my thing: mm. know where the end goal is, but not clear what steps are actually going to be a return on their investment. It's almost a fear of wasting time. For example, mm. like for me, I know where I sort of want to be. Or let's take this podcast for example, right? Yeah. I know where I'd want to be with it, but you know, if you do, people will say online, like, patience. And if the content's good, it, you know, people will hear it. If it's not getting views, it's not good enough. And the same thing I can imagine with social media, where it's like, I've had people say, these are the best interviews I've ever been on. I've seen people go, I learn more from your podcast than I do from some courses. Yet the numbers don't always reflect the feedback, which leads you to procrastinate because like, why would I waste time on learning about YouTube algorithms or sending DMs to people or making, looking at thumbnail design when I could do all of this work and not be any closer in a year's time. Like, do you see that more than the end goal? Or? I think I see both. I see both in isolation sometimes and I see both work together sometimes. Okay. So, or yeah, I, I do see all of them and it is, it is a challenge. I think sometimes people think about like the end goal itself is partly the issue is that, realistically for most people in the coaching business you're not there's no end goal you you either stop doing this and do something else like who who is building it to the point where they then sell you're not going public with it like it's not not reach ipo you're going to be doing this forever and actually when you kind of we get that kind of arrival fallacy when i get to this point then i'll be happy or successful or whatever and obviously you either don't get there and optimize for that rather than for enjoyment or you get there and realize that it wasn't the the thing that was going to make you happy like you thought it was. And both of them are problems in their own right. So um, yeah, I think the big picture stuff isn't just about goals necessarily and like finance and income and stuff or like engagement on numbers. Um, it's about like what is providing purpose and meaning for me. What are my values? If my values are educating, 
Does that have to be to 100,000 people? Do the podcast have to hit numbers in order to do that? If I've got one message saying it's had a massive impact on me, have you not lived in a way that aligns with your values? Mm. Like the, I suppose, like because you always find these almost two competing philosophies when you start looking at people who offer the, let's call it the self help realm. I think that's a bit mm. of a disservice to what you do, but it's the closest thing I can mm-hmm. think of. Is that you have the sort of American dream ethos of goal setting, and mm. I think that's important. If you're not going somewhere, if you've got no purpose. Why would you get off the sofa and do anything? We see this all the time with, I'm sure you do with your nutrition consulting. Same thing we do with personal training clients. If people are feeling they're just dieting for the sake of dieting, they won't move. Mm. They need goals, they need direction, they need purpose. But we also see the flip side of this of like, well, the stoicism sort of approach to this, where it's like being kind of happy where you are. Because at the end of the day, you are always in the moment. You're always mm. doing the process. And if you can't enjoy that to any degree, you're yeah. chasing something that you'll never reach. And mm-hmm. It's Chris Williamson said it really well that you've achieved goals that you already that you said would have made you happy but haven't. So yep. where is this balance when you speak to coaches between we need a purpose to strive for and we also need to be able to be accepting of where you're at and sometimes that means not finishing that to-do list for the hundredth mm. time. Where's that balance between productivity and uber productivity where it actually is a detriment? Yeah, absolutely. So I think... Um... You spoke to something there where I think you have to be able to hold two potentially conflicting ideas and make space for both of them at the same time. I think often this kind of self-help advice is far too black and white and not nearly nuanced enough to accurately reflect the human condition. Humans are complex and I can have a view on one thing. And then if you just tweak the question slightly, I have an opposing view completely. When in reality, you'd say, well, you said it about this. So why don't you say about this? Well, I'm complicated. Um, So like, it's okay for me to kind of hold both of those things and for them both to be true for me in that I want to achieve my goals and be kind of ruthless with that, but then try and enjoy the process at the same time. And actually, I think that's probably how I would view productivity in that I don't think it's about how can I work as many hours as possible or to like maximize output necessarily is probably to be more efficient and to spend less time working and then you can spend more time doing the stuff that you actually enjoy for me that just happens to be more work um luckily for me or not luckily if you're my missus depending on perspective um well actually she'd have to spend time with me so it's probably lucky for her as well um but yeah like for some people i want to work three or four hours a day and then i want to go and do other stuff fine like that's that's purpose for you. So understanding what the goals are, but then also understanding that I don't want to sacrifice that present in the moment thing just for an arbitrary goal that I'm setting anyway. Mm. I suppose helpful. it's like I suppose it's like periodization with training, right? So you've got periodization, mm. which is understanding what the what the goal of the block is and where that fits into an entire year, and then mm-hmm. also understanding about uh, over, over the days today, you're going to have to auto regulate that to some degree. So yeah. Uh, Ollie Carson from Supercharge says this really well in business. There is hunting seasons and farming seasons. Mm-hmm. So farming seasons are where you work on the business, you create content, maybe you study, maybe you upskill. Hunting seasons where you go out and start hunting for clients. So if yeah. you know that, and I've seen this, um, loads of coaches uh, take the same sort of approach, whether they know it or not. Travis Jones, who owned the RBT gyms and now runs business mentorships in Australia, he he likes working aggressively for like two months or so and then taking a whole month holiday yeah. so it's like if you can understand that time of when it's like right this is go 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 time and maybe you you have very very clear goals and maybe you work when you don't want to work knowing that you'll give that have that time back down the line and then maybe auto regulating like we spoke off air about my my current predicament with you know my marital struggles it's like i now know i need to auto regulate a little bit because I maybe won't be able to get 10 things off to the do list in a day like I did a year mm-hmm. ago. It's like, what is the most important now? And understanding, right, what is the need to do business stuff? Like technically, I only have five hours a week of true work unless people are booking one-to-one calls in my business. That's the need to do. If I do nothing mm-hmm. else, I won't grow the business, but my clients will be happy. I'll give an amazing service and that's it. I could spend the rest mm-hmm. of the time doing whatever I need to. But, if I only ever did that, then I would I, my business would start to fall as people start to drop off. So we, it's that finding like some weeks I need to go, right, here's the week where I do a 40-hour week. And the other weeks where 
I'm okay with this being a five hour week and I'm going to recharge and maybe work some stuff like studying. That's still work, but you need a clear, relaxed head to do that. You can't go in organs blazing, sympathetic, dominant state to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And I actually get coaches to think like this, to think, describe yourself as a cognitive athlete. And I think if coaches thought about how do they optimize their own productivity as much as they think about optimizing their training, they'd be better coaches with better businesses. And I don't think it's that controversial to say that, but yeah, I would absolutely be breaking work down into um, a kind of macro cycle, which I would probably put at about 12 weeks. I think a year is a really long time to have a goal for, which it's, it's too far to feel like you're having impact on it every single day but not close enough where you're getting feedback on the things to know whether you're going in the right direction. So 12 weeks, I think is a better time scale for that kind of macro cycle. Within that, I would think about like sort of two week meso cycles. So sprint, which is kind of part of um, agile methodology, which is used on a lot of knowledge work um, that allows you to reflect on is the work I'm doing actually moving me towards that macro cycle goal. If not, I've got time to adjust it for the, for the next two weeks. Um, the kind of micro cycle would be the week, which is more about kind of reflection. Am I using the, my energy and time over the week effectively? And then your session is your day and thinking about the intensities that you work over the course of the day. How do you optimize for that? So I would think about high intensity, which is you're really cognitively demanding work. How much of that have I got? Realistically, people don't do anywhere near as much high intensity work with their brain as they think they do or think they can. Um, there's some interesting data actually on cognitive work where, some people said they think they work about an hour and 53 minutes a day where they're like really focused in, switched, switched on properly in. Um, and I'm not surprised by that at all. I think people can expand that, but not by loads. Like the kind of eight hour work day is probably a hangover from industrial times where we were doing physical work. So that high sort of high intensity cognitive work, steady state stuff, which is your kind of admin, your replies, the stuff you don't really realize and you're doing just sort of, um, writing content that sort of stuff and then active and passive recovery and most people don't have enough of those two things in over the day so active recovery would be learning would be thinking would be possibly creating but like spending more time with your ideas and then passive recovery is switching off from work and that active recovery is the bit that coaches just don't do and they kind of just sit at their laptop and assume that time at their laptop is efficient use of time and then how many coaches do we know where it's like, I've done all my check-ins, done the programming, got through the day. Oh shit, it's the end of the day and I've not done any content. Uh, let's write a post about why consistency is important, why discipline matters. Here's some high protein hacks. And like, frankly, who gives a fuck? And mm. like, that's why. And then you get another kind of uh, content cycle where I've not spent enough time on my ideas. I put out shit content. The content gets poor engagement. We go, well, there's no point because the algorithm, so I'm not going to bother with content. We then spend less time on it. The content gets worse and you get stuck in that cycle and your business doesn't grow. So my kind of big idea is you are judged by the quality of your ideas. How much time are you spending on your ideas per week? And most coaches, it's not nearly enough. Mm. I've I've certainly found that like like now running a mentorship for coaches, my I am paid for my knowledge rather than my time, like I was when I was a gym floor PT. Mm -hmm. And I found that I've been able to learn more. I've been able to reflect more because it's not about doing 30 hours a week. It's about what do I need? It's about the quality of the time that I give and less so about the amount of time. And it doesn't mean that I don't have weeks where I absolutely grind out a bunch of time or mm -hmm. at least consider I do, like may, whether that's productive time, maybe we can talk about. But an interesting thing, I want to break down in a second about almost going from that macro, meso and micro cycle and what can we do at each stage. But something you really struck on there that I thought was really interesting about like doing the check-ins and realizing they've still got content to do. Do you feel coaches often make this harder for themselves? Because as we do a task more and more and more, we consider it just part of our routine, not necessarily an actual win. So for like, how many of like, if we were talking to a client who wanted fat loss, and they'd never been to the gym before. Them going to the gym is a huge tick in the win column. That means they've done something productive today. But coaches, they've been training for so many years, that's just something they have. They just do. So is their check-ins. So is their content. So is their DMs, right? So we end up at this point where there's five or six things in the to-do list that aren't wins. We, start, we don't start the day at zero and work up. We start the day at negative six. And we have to do all these things that take up most of our day to get to zero 
and then do something else to be mm-hmm. productive. Do you find that where cl- uh, coaches are never feeling like they've achieved anything, despite if you look at the day, they've done tons? And if so, how does someone get out of that mentality? Yeah, I definitely think that they, they do they do have that mentality at times. But I think also your brain will like novelty. And if you don't provide it with some time and space for novelty and for for things that are like new and enjoyable and are provide positive thought, feeling, and emotion, you're not gonna have it and you're gonna probably find yourself doing busy work. You you made an interesting parallel there with like training. This is something I work on with nutrition clients, but also has application for coaches, is that I work a lot with sort of relationship with food, emotional eating type clients. And I will always say to clients, if you don't have anything that gives you positive thoughts, feelings, or emotions, you're going to use food for those things. And what that's the sort of co- the clients that say, oh, I need food for, at the weekend as a reward. And I would say, well, actually you do, but that's because you're working 70 hours a week and you've got sod all else going on. So it's no surprise that you feel like you need reward because it's not coming anywhere else. If you put some more of those things in, you'll really, you'll really start to find that you actually don't need food as much. With coaches, it's kind of the same. Like wherever you put in into some of those things that give you challenge and give you that feeling that you're actually doing something that is meaningful, that is pushing you and that kind of regardless of the outcome, is enjoyable now that's true in the business so am i putting out new ideas that i think no one else is talking about like this like i am that's cool and then also are you doing it outside of work like have you got hobbies and things that you can do that are helping you switch off um so yeah i think coaches need to recognize how much they are doing but then also they do need something in their week where it's like this is to do with the business but it's it's kind of new and it's pushing me because otherwise otherwise we do get and i see this in the corporate work i do you get a kind of do you know about parkinson's law yeah yeah so like for people listening who might not time kind of uh, your work expands to fill the time that you give it i see a lot of um people who have got full calendars in corporate world in the corporate life and i will say to them the one thing i want you to do is put in four hours of learning development personal development career growth type stuff And they'll say, oh, I haven't got the time for that. And then they do it and they realize actually they're now way more productive because A, they find a time that if you can do, you can do in 30 hours what you think you can in 40. And B, that's the stuff that energizes them so that everything else feels easier and more productive. And so actually it takes less time anyway because they've got a bit about them to do it. So yes, your tasks, like you kind of need to remember, yeah, I've been really productive and actually this is work and it's meaningful, but you probably also need to dedicate time to doing stuff that feels new, that is moving the business, that isn't kind of your core business tasks. Mm. That that hit home to me in, in in so many ways. And it's things I say to coaches all the time. It's like a lot of coaches now, we've, we've got to this point where people are focusing on marketing and virality and sell it, trying to sell a product they haven't actually built yet. They haven't mm. focused on the product enough. Like we're both in... Louis Calvert's mentorship, and he focuses on the offer. And essentially what I do with coaches is help them build the actual product because we see this brilliant niche on Instagram and then clients come in and it's completely different. And I I'd always say like, look, like, yes, you doing an hour of study a day might not bring you in revenue this, this month. It might not give you the immediate dopamine reward as doing 100 outreach strategies and getting a client would do. But Doing that personal or professional development stuff means that you will not go broke ever again in five years because you're a better professional. It also means you're you're going to improve your attention, which will make you more money. I've had clients stay with me five years and I asked them why. And I was expecting goal setting. I was expecting training program design. I was doing all sorts of different things. And they got, because you invest so much in yourself as a professional and as a coach, I am investing in the coach you're becoming in five years. So your attention mm. improves. So I think, and I also find that I used to go to in-person events quite a lot. And any time that I felt a little bit run down and burnt out working with clients and it, everything became the same, like monotonous day-to-day, same people, same sessions, I go to a seminar and I come back and now I'm excited to work with them. And it wasn't about the new skills I learned at the seminar as it was about the energy that I have was now infectious to my clients. They adhered to their plans better. I enjoyed it more. I got stuck in more. This is domino effect with, with like doing stuff and looking after yourself that you, you sort of don't get. And mm-hmm. you, the, the other thing you mentioned there was about um, 
having stuff in your life. And I again, this is this is this is probably the most personal thing I've said in 180 episodes on this show, because people have probably heard me talk about my my current predicament if they listen to these regularly and understand what happened. My relate, recent relationship ended because of a not quite an addiction, but a borderline pornography problem. And it was a real eye-opening experience because like the things that helped me manage and empty my stress cup, it wasn't an, uh, an, uh, an arousal thing by the end. It was like, that's a way to clear my head when I was overwhelmed or burnt out or stressed or confused or my life was in chaos. And then you remove the person I would have talked to about stress. You remove the person where I would have gotten relief in those areas away. And if you just said to me, Simon, go abstinent from those that behavior it might be the right thing to do don't get me wrong and it should be done but that you, you haven't addressed the reason why that's happening you haven't just like you haven't addressed the emotional eating connection you haven't addressed the reason why someone doom scrolls the reason why someone procrastinates right you've just said get rid of it whereas if i then started doing hobbies built my social connections really focused my business got clarity there you might find that behavior tends to go away anyway because your emotions shifted elsewhere. And I remember reading a post, you, you wrote about that, about doom scrolling and procrastination is the problem, not the actual root cause of the issue. So mm. delve into that a little bit, because I bet a lot of people here have got, including myself, have low on level 15,000 on Candy Crush, but <laughs> don't do any DM outreach. Yeah, and I, I do think like the there's, again, parallels between food and productivity in that sense in that we think i've got a problem with this thing when actually that is the symptom not the problem itself so emotionally and i say this to clients all the time like oh i've got a problem with biscuits no you haven't you've probably got a problem with hunger management because you you don't have breakfast you have a light lunch and then three o'clock when you start to get bored tired overwhelmed from work you eat biscuits and then you think oh yeah biscuit issue no you haven't you've got lots of other issues and that's the symptom of those problems whether it's I cope with stress with biscuits. I um, am hungry and the food environment is just biscuits, like all of those things. With procrastinating on your phone, it's the same. I um, have got difficult check-ins to do. I've got business tasks that I've not completely clear on. I've got this kind of project that I've not broken down into tasks. It's just called like right lead magnet and I'm wondering why it's been on my list for six months and I've never done it. Um, You've got all of these things. So you go on your phone and you go, oh, I've wasted three hours doom scrolling today. I've got a problem with being on my phone too much. You've actually got a problem with identifying your problem. You've got a problem with why are you going on your phone for that long? And it's probably because there is some sort of discomfort related to your work. Same with food. There is discomfort related to your life. You're using food to help with that. I do think generally as a population, our discomfort tolerance is lower because as soon as we feel uncomfortable, you can go on your smartphone and you can go on social media and forget all about it. Um, I had a real issue a few months ago where I was feeling bad about something. So like anxious, worried, general, normal spectrum of emotions. And I'd go on my phone and I'd forget what the thing was, but the anxiety would still be there. And so I was just sort of sitting there with like low level anxiety, trying to remember what the fuck I was being anxious about because I'd already distracted myself by going on Instagram. I've had times where I have opened Instagram, swiped off it, and then gone on Instagram again, only to see the same post and realize I was literally just on there. That's how instinctive it was for me to go on Instagram. So if you can understand, right, these are the uh, underlying problems as to why I'm turning to my phone, you can start to address what the solutions are. And there's actually some interesting literature on recovery from work that is called. So... There are kind of four things that we need. There is control of our time. There is relaxation, so our ability to switch off. Detachment. So this is really relevant for coaches. Most coaches do not detach from their work very well. So the difference between home you and work you is kind of, there isn't one. You're living at work essentially rather than work from home. Um, And mastery. So that ability to find challenge and positive thought, feeling, emotion from something that isn't work. And if we think about the people who maybe feel overwhelmed or feel burnt out all the times when we have, it's normally because we don't have those four things. Mm, I agree. I agree with that ma- uh, massively. I think they, when you, you alluded to mastery, and I think that you, you, there's another avenue of mastery as well. And I think coaches, I, 
Mm. This might be controversial because I'm a big fan of therapy and I think people should have therapy. But I, I, the problem I find with coaching mastery these days, doing something like for sake of argument, and I appreciate that I am biased because I run a company that does this, but becoming a better coach and learning about the things that are the gaps in your knowledge is a long game. It's hard work. So I've seen coaches that have been really keen in the DMs to, to join SMU and I'll reach out to them because they haven't. I'm just like, hey, how are you getting on? Want to check in, see how you are. And they're going, can't afford it right now. I've just joined X therapy, counseling, mindset coach. And, I'm, I, and, and sometimes you need it, right? I've had a bunch of therapy. I think it's so valuable. But often I go, you don't need therapy. You need results. The problem you're getting with your lack of retention, the problem you're getting with your clients not following your plans, you put, it's because you either don't have the knowledge to get in there or you're sitting on your hands and procrastinating and making decisions because you doubt yourself. It's not a mental problem with this. It's a, you need more skills. And if you had more skills, you'd have more confidence. And if you had more confidence, you'd get more results. And those results would make you feel better about your job. And that problem would go away. But we think it's a problem here now because we're so conditioned mm. to for this quick, I need to get a 10 grand month this month. And I, and you, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier on where you went, we, we have a slightly slower tolerance to discomfort. I said this on a podcast I recorded on a Monday. Imagine going into Dragon's Den with a float tank idea in 2001. People will be, I'm out. You're just going to sit in a big bathtub with the lights off and charge people £100 for the privilege. No <laughs> chance. But now life's become so comfortable. If we want food, we can get on delivery, right? Mm. If we want distraction, we can get on our phone, right? It's here. I'm literally sitting with in front of it. I could get a notification, join this. I'm going to turn upside down, so I don't. But because of that, we never sit with these things. Do you think there's like a real importance these days? Because we see it with the, the dopamine curve, right? We get the spike. And the bigger the spike, whether that is food, gambling, entertainment, drugs, pornography insert coping mechanism we all have here the larger the trough and the longer that trough will be do you think the people who are always looking for stuff need to be able to have time in the day where they have tmp we call this king and queen time where you just sort of step back do nothing or find joy in something like reading or walking or sitting in the park because people have the best ideas in like the shower and all that <laughs> all that's changed is that they've let their body not chase stimulus yeah yeah absolutely and like there's good neuroscience data around like the fact that when your brain is not doing that kind of focus work is when it can do that sort of creative thinking and can problem solve for you so this is something i'm huge on in terms of overwhelm is that the real issue with coach overwhelm it's not that you feel bad because frankly i don't care that much that you feel like shit the thing for your business is it's it stops you having your best ideas which is what grows your business is having great ideas the, the state that you're written means that you've not got the mental capacity to have ideas. And from like an evolutionary perspective, this makes sense. Like if you were being chased by a tiger, that fight or flight response, you don't want to be thinking like, oh, what person would I like to be in fucking five years? You'll get eaten. So like you need to piss off out of the way. But when that's chronic, you can't think creatively. So you can't think long term. You're thinking like, how do I survive today? And you can't think wide. You're thinking very, very narrow. And that's a problem for coaches. So, and you can't sort of cut you off. But you can't. You can't study as well. I see coaches that mm. want to be better coaches and they'll study, and they'll be like, "This isn't going in," and they reinforce that belief of "I am the imposter syndrome of I am rubbish at this. I am yeah. not good enough. I could never be like this person." I get mm. coaches say this to me, and I'm like, "Dude, see me in any other avenue of life." And I am a fucking moron. If you, because I know a little bit about how the thyroid works, I know a moment arm in a training program, doesn't mean that I'm a smart person. It means I've just gritted this out through those same feelings, those same periods, those same struggles, and just did it for 15 years. Yeah. I think we see so much in the fitness condition now of like quasi difficulty chasing almost. So like people are doing fucking ice baths and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and stuff. Because hard things make us stronger and stuff. But like, that's not hard for you. You're you're pretending to do hard things to show Instagram them. Hard things for you would be sitting down for two hours with a physiology textbook or sitting down for two hours and thinking, I'm trying to sell fat loss the same way that everyone else is. What are my views on fat loss that are completely different to everyone else? That's difficult for you. And you're avoiding that by doing 
some of the more wanky fitness things that look hard but aren't actually difficult for you training's not hard for you because you love mm. it even if it is hard even if it is hard it's and it's it, you're avoiding the thing that's actually hard for you so like mm. like an ice bath for example ice bath's a great question i actually had a question it's difficult about ice bath yeah because yeah and and then, then you can talk about the physiology and pros and cons from fat loss mm. benefit pretty fucking pointless so i mean yeah under, being able to handle stress and breathe through it potentially great but mm. what you'll see is that people will go i'll get in an ice bath and yes that's difficult but it's much easier than identifying where i want to be or dming mm. people or feeling salesy or putting an offer out or insert anything or learning about thyroid because you're not sure yeah. you're hiding from that negativity feeling so yes it's hard but it's yeah. distraction hard. It's not, it's hard that doesn't move you anywhere. No one said yeah. in 10 years' time going, he is the best ice bath sitter in the world. Unless you're Wim Hof. Yeah, that's yeah. not happening. <laughs> yeah. And I, I've got nothing against... I laugh at these practices. I've got nothing against them whatsoever. And I think they're probably beneficial for lots of the reasons you said uh, for people. I mean, realistically, if it's placebo, but you feel fucking great afterwards, then you feel great. Like It doesn't really matter. But... Yeah, sometimes for me, I'm not great at the kind of self-care switching off traditional self-care stuff. But one of the best things for my business and for me, my mental health, I learned a while ago was sometimes very occasionally for me, self-care is working Saturday and Sunday for 14 hours a day. And actually like working on my business and doing things that I've kind of put off throughout the week and then gone, well, they're still there. They still need doing. This is probably a few years ago because I don't generally get to this point anymore because I'm better at it. But Self-care is sometimes just working longer and doing more hard work on your business, which sounds incredibly hustle culture. And I hate that. But because the work is the hard thing that you're avoiding by kind of trying to do hard things, but still not doing the thing you should. Sometimes self-care is actually I've got to work late tonight to get this done, to launch this project, to to work on this, to spend some time learning where I wouldn't do normally. Like that's that self-care. Well, because you couldn't do like he, I, I always I, I, I completely agree with you and I agree with you in the, I, we we have it's it's like you know people were pushing really really hard for transformations in the fat loss world like five mm-hmm. to ten years ago and now we've seen the pendulum swing the other way where everyone's talking about sustainability and habits and you got to have like 300 different chicken burrito low carb burrito recipes and it's like you're actually making clients lives harder because mm-hmm. sometimes if you give people a fix for their cravings they don't lose the cravings because they're not having that absence from it. I think the same thing with self-care with coaching. Where we're like, give yourself a break. And yeah, but I could sit in a park all day doing nothing except listening to chill music. If my brain's going, you haven't done the thing yet, Simon. You haven't done the thing yet, Simon. It's not yeah. chill anyway. So sometimes yeah. the best self-care thing is to do the thing. So when I do relax, I am truly relaxed. Yeah. Yeah, that comes back to what I said about detachment. And that if you're not at work, but your brain is thinking about work, you are still working fundamentally from a physiological physiological perspective you're still at work so you need to be able to do the work and to close loops and to box things off and then to switch off you can't just say oh this is an arbitrary time where i'd like to finish work but it's still going today so i'm just gonna not do that like i'll leave the stuff that needs doing today oh it's the kind of hard things that have got to the bottom of the list again never mind i'll leave those so then a lot of planning work needs to be about well how do we make sure that you're doing things that really matters to you right now at the times when you feel at your best and get them done and then have that ability to detach you have that positive feeling you're like fucking i did something hard today and then you can switch off and actually feel good about switching off mm. when it, um going back into that sort of like periodization of sort of productivity when mm-hmm. we look at sort of like the mesosoc, you said like you think a year is too long and that we're probably going to be looking at a 12 week block and I, I i can totally agree with that Mm-hmm. Do you think that there is an element of, co- and this goes back to your original point, of coaches needing to understand where the bigger picture is to make 12 weeks worthwhile? For example, I don't drive, right? So mm-hmm. if, I know when people who drive get really excited about getting a new like Ford KA, and I'm like, if it's not an Aston Martin, I don't care about cars. In the same way that like a fat loss client, I could tell them to lose 1% of their body weight this week. But I'm not excited to go walking in the rain or do a training session when I don't want to or put down the donut for the 1%. But if I've got in my head a goal, and I see this with coaches set goal setting with their clients all the time, they'll go, they're 35% body fat and the goal is 25. Like, Why is the goal 25? It's like, well, that's realistic in the time frame. I'm like, if you were, if you had a, like, and it's a horrible analogy, but if you had like, 
cancer in a private a country with private healthcare like America, they wouldn't give you a prescription based on your budget. They give you a prescription based on keeping you alive. Your budget's kind of irrelevant. You set the goal that if they couldn't fail, they'd want to achieve, even if it's a year, two years worth of work. Because And then you go, right, but here's where we're going to be in the next 12 weeks. Because if I've got an image of I can look like a men's health cover model, that's on its own, that's too far and that's overwhelming. But if I don't have that at all, I'm just thinking of the next step. I'm like, who cares about that? I can just do that tomorrow. Like, hmm. do you think there's a point of, for the 12-week goal to work, we need to have a somewhat, even though it will change and evolve, a relatively clear vision of where these 12 weeks are adding up to? Yeah. Hundred percent, and I set like annual goals. Don't get me wrong, but I don't. I wouldn't use those to drive my ways of working. And okay. I have, I have, I generally get coaches think about five years away because I think that's a really good time frame where you're like so much can change. I, I think I was twenty four five years ago, uh, and I didn't have any of the businesses that I run now. So mm. like five years is an incredibly long amount of time. So like that really gets you thinking like, what am I capable of? And then I'll break it down into those 12 week blocks. And realistically, that fucking five year goal will change. Like you probably won't even get there, but at least it's going to give you some direction, not just financially, but like what what do I want a day to look like? How do I want to work? Do I want to coach one to one? Do I want to do group group stuff in person, online, that sort of thing? It gets you thinking about those questions. And that then allows you to think, okay, well, what would that look like broken down into 12 weeks? Mm. So if you go from that sort of block then into the week, how does a coach structure their week to get the best out of themselves? Is it, I will split my work up into smaller chunks across five days, or do I have theme days, or have a check-in day and a content day? Mm -hmm. What have you tended to see work more often? Um, I think, which doesn't really answer your question, I've tended to see an approach that's individualized to the coach work Mm -hmm. best. But I do, there are some like, and I talk about this a lot, there are like rough common themes around from a cognitive perspective, what does work best for performance? But that doesn't mean that that's exactly what you should do as a person. So like the example, the analogy I make with this is um, training around the menstrual cycle. There are kind of rough ideas of maybe where, what might be best or where strength might change over the cycle and things like that. And that is fine. In reality, it's incredibly difficult to research. I've got a friend at the moment who's researching protein synthesis during the cycle in athletes and like looking at different protein doses and how that affects such incredibly difficult stuff to research that you can kind of take it with a pinch of salt. There's not going to be loads. So this is how it might change, but you'll know better than the research, but anyway, how you feel and what works best for you. Hmm. Kind of the same with productivity. We know context, context shifting is not a good idea generally. And the more we do it, the more fatigue we feel, the worse our brain performs. So actually if you can set up a week where you're shifting context less, that is probably going to help. Now, whether that looks like individual days for individual types of work, whether it's blocking the work so you might have a morning for check-ins and an afternoon for programming and then half a day for ideas for content, half a day recording it, it's going to change for the for the coach. But my thing is it should be intentional. Whatever you do, there should be intention where you've planned it. And you're going to iterate on it anyway, but there should at least be some thought behind it this is like you i should be able to say how have you scheduled your week and why and you've given me a rationale for it why why do you feel that coaches i suppose everybody but i certainly see it in the coaching space uh struggle with sticking to structure it's a good question and it's kind of uh similar to clients so like you know when clients uh don't plan their food and then their food goes to shit and they're like oh yeah it just didn't go how i wanted it to today or they'll plan and then the, they didn't stick to that plan. Then they go, well, the plan's useless. There's no point in me planning. Coaches kind of do the same thing in that they will, pl- they'll either not plan and just be chaotic and give it a bit of, this is just who I am. It's how I work. Hee <laughs> hee, what am I like? There's a bit of that. But then there's also a bit of, oh, I tried to plan and then like one day it kind of didn't work and I went on my phone. So there's no point in me planning anything, which is really silly because the plan you should be able to flex the plan. Like a plan is not, you must do this. In the same way with food, like it shouldn't be eat this at this time on this day and nothing else will do. Like, oh, you're you're in the car on the way home from work, well, take your microwave and plug it into the bag lighter. <laughs> like stuff like that, do, that's not what plans are for. But if you have zero structure, then how, how do you know whether you've been successful with something? How do you know what didn't work so you can change it for next time? So 
again, similar to food in that people need some guidelines and some constraints because you can't just say, just eat well and expect people to know what to do. But then at the other end of that spectrum, you can't say you need to eat this much of this at this time. For most people, that's not going to work. So you need to find somewhere in the middle. And that's a plan that's kind of flexible and that you can adjust based on, I was going to do loads and loads of really difficult work today that's not people facing, but like big project work, but I didn't sleep. So I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to change it up and do that later on and mess around with the schedule. But because most people don't have systems for managing tasks, projects, their calendar, stuff like that, they can't do that because they haven't got eyes and everything anyway. So how can they say, I'll do it on this day instead? Because they haven't got a fucking clue what they're doing next Tuesday. So how can they say I'll do it next Tuesday? Because they don't know what that's going to look like. Hmm. How do people start to build those systems? I think you have to understand what is it that I need to start with and where are the issues I have. So I generally like, my big thing is people should do this on a computer. I A lot of people that I see are overwhelmed are doing stuff on pen and paper still. And again, this is really controversial and probably just because I'm in my 20s and this is why I think everyone, but you live on a in a digital world, you're an online coach. And I've never met someone who's like, oh yeah, well, I'm just a trusty pen and paper who then isn't also the person that's feeling really overwhelmed. And I think the reason for this is a pen and paper only really allows you to plan for the day or maybe a couple of days at most. When actually you're a business, so you need to be thinking about a week, two weeks, a month. 12 weeks like we spoke about like Microsoft and Apple aren't just thinking like, well, what are we going to do today? Lol. Like they've got plans and campaigns and things like that. Managing that on, on like uh, software or at least on your computer is so much easier because you can move things. It gives you so much better visibility over a period of time. So that would be my number one thing is making it digital to start with. Mm. I, I hugely agree with that. I think one of the biggest things that I did is when, when I, first moved back to the uk and i went completely online which because a lot of coaches especially if they've come from the gym floor their structure was given to them so mm-hmm. there's, it's no surprise the structure goes to goes to pop as soon as they go online because they never had any flexibility of how they worked and where they worked is the client books in they turn up and then they go from that to nothing and they're like mm. oh my god i've got all this freedom and you often find then they'll overstructure like you say yeah. and then you get to the point where they left the gym floor because they wanted more freedom and they've just changed being on the gym floor for eight hours a day with being in their office for eight hours a day. Like I still yeah. feel guilty when I do a lecture from a coffee shop because I'm like, well, that's the whiteboard with the skeleton. Like it's going to be poor yeah. quality. But the feedback I actually get was, I can't believe you did a call from Budapest. In my head, it's, mm. oh, this is why it's bad. My students go, oh my God, this is such good value that you're still doing them. Mm. You, I think sometimes, maybe it's an imposter gym thing, but we kind of, I know this is a tangent, but we beat ourselves up based on what we think the standard of the competition is. Like I mm-hmm. had a student start with me recently, gone through multiple business mentor, multiple courses, messaged me after my sales call, not even the first proper call. He went, mm. I've never had anyone go through stuff in that much detail. I was like, you don't even pay me money. And my, my brain's going, I didn't do anything. Yeah, You don't realize how low the bar actually is mm-hmm. when we live in an Instagram world where everyone looks like they're on it all the time and everyone is chaotic it's idiots all the way up yeah 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 yeah. and i think i'm gonna go on a tangent based on your tangent now (laughs) this is something i'm so big on in terms of ideas is um do you know who rory sutherland is yeah 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 so like big marketing guy for people that don't know (laughs) two things that he says i'm obsessed with him by the way and i'll come on to why that's a great idea um he always says the opposite of a good idea is another good idea sometimes so sometimes the best idea is i'm gonna be on every single platform all over the place with really well edited uh, videos, reels, hooks, optimized everything. The opposite of a good idea might be, I'm only going to do one sort of post on one platform. It's always going to be a carousel or it's always going to be like a tweet like post. But the ideas can be so fucking amazing that people that won't care. And like you, that goes back to your example of like, nothing was optimized apart from the, the content of it. And people are like, that's class. So like, yeah. does it all matter? Sometimes it can, and that can be great. You can be like hormosy and have that kind of shit, or you can just do like the real basics, but do it really well. And that works well. The other thing he says is if we all try and copy each other, which people tend to do, particularly coaches, you all end up in the same place. And then it, how do you ever stand out? We all kind of optimize for like blending in with everyone else, which is the opposite of what a business really wants. So his, he's such a good example in that if he comes up on my phone, I watch him Mm. every single time. Like 
I've watched pretty much every YouTube show, Instagram reel. I listen to every podcast. I will search his name sporadically and listen to every podcast he's on. I went, I paid 650 quid for his uh, behavioral economics conference. I went to that this year. He is a great example of, he is the hook. So all of the people in the fitness industry are fucking around trying to blurt out like three seconds of like, if you struggle with fat loss, listen to this. And like, well, actually, the hook should just be, oh my God, it's him speaking again. He always speaks sense. Love the way he thinks about things. I'll listen. Yeah. But coaches are trying to optimize for what everyone else is doing and then yeah. wonder why they don't stand out. I, 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 I could not agree more with that. One of the biggest things that uh, I'm working with Louis is, is, is sort of like becoming the authoritative coach. Because if, like, if you ask 90% of coaches, I know we've gone on a content tangent rather than productivity, but it's, it's, I think it's a good fun. They... If you ask coaches who they look up to, they'll say, and again, I'm just going to throw names out that I look up to. People might say Kasim Hansen from N1 or Jordan Shallow or Michael Gordon or Tom Purvis. Insert these things here, right? Uh, do you know who Tom Purvis is? Don't think so. So Tom Purvis um, runs a company called Resistance Training Specialist or RTS. It's the exercise mechanics of personal trainers. A lot of people right. follow him. And Tom, at least his social media presence when he does do social media, is a relatively kind of grumpy, can be a bit condescending to to a degree, but one Mm. of the smartest individuals ever, right? You will never see him dancing on TikTok to a video, right? And people looking up things, they're not doing the tactics you're doing. What's Mm. the difference? Why are you going to them? Like, if you were looking for a coach, would you hire you? Mm. If the answer is no, ask yourself why. Is it because you don't have good enough hooks or your editing isn't good. It's yeah. because you're not good enough. So invest mm-hmm. in being better. Don't invest in being flashier because flashier yeah. might get you a quick win and more eyes on Instagram, but it won't get you to where you want to be. As you said, the, you know, Roy isn't flashy. He just gives good no. information. You seek him out. Yeah. And yeah. the second thing I thought was really interesting you said there is about the flashiness versus the simplicity of content is sometimes it's important to have a pattern break. So if you're naturally being more flashy, and if you're getting overwhelmed by that process, throw out an easy bit of content. The honest Mm. life coach, Andrew Keeler, right? He's got a big growing audience now. And if you look at his videos, it's all, he just records himself, he sticks it on Instagram, he puts Instagram captures on, he posts it. It is so low maintenance because Mm. the quality is good. And I remember when I worked for UP, Nick Mitchell, every now and again, he'd throw up a before and after that wasn't branded with the UP branding. And what he'd always say is like, normally I send this to my team to make it all branded, but I just couldn't sit on this result. Mm. And when I see him post one without the brand, I go, oh, what's this? In the same yeah. way if I'm used to people being having edited posts, if I see a really raw video, it's a pattern interrupt. And mm. sometimes having that complete tonal shift from what you've been doing actually yeah. is the thing that makes people stop and share. Like I've mm. started pro wrestling as a hobby as of two weeks ago, right? Not Olympic wrestling, like pants and promos. Yeah. And one of the things I, at some point, I will need to get good at the promo side of it. That's not what they're teaching. They're teaching bumps and rolls. So mm. I thought, well, let's use Instagram for this. So these reels that I'll make, they might fall flat in the face, but they might be so amazingly different. People might think I'm annoyed and ask why. Because I'm dialing myself up to an 11 and making this a performance in some way that no one on Instagram's doing. Who mm. knows? We'll see if it does well. But it's just yeah. that, again gone on a tangent but that pattern interrupt is huge and but people overthink their content i yeah. need an editor for it to be good no you don't you need to do yeah. it for it to be good yeah, yeah yeah and like this isn't even a tangent because my thing is people should have better ideas so i completely agree i think another thing that rory says sometimes is i can't even remember what he was what i was going to say now something about content you said something that really triggered what i was going to say and i've I'm completely right. forgotten it uh, pattern break yeah so it was about like how content we're optimizing for the wrong thing so a big thing he's big on is like people really optimize for data when actually you you aren't optimizing for the things you can't see because we're so obsessed with like optimizing for tangible data that we're not thinking about like what's the stuff that i can't measure that's equally as important so everyone's like oh how do i get more viral how do i get better engagement how do i get more people to like my stuff and stuff like that like who's paying their mortgage with instagram likes no one is if i know like i've got friends in the industry who have gone viral how many like clients did they get from it none how many fat phobic comments to get loads how many death threats some like why do you want to go viral and i'm not 
trying to blow my own trumpet because I don't like to, but the productivity stuff, I had the idea because I was doing this in the corporate world, had the idea to do it with coaches because I'm one. It took me 45 days from thinking about doing it with coaches to having an offer and have made sales, having set up a new Instagram and a new Threads account. And that's because I literally have spent time with these ideas for a long while and I sat down and thought about them for some more and refined them for coaches. I've got 150 followers and I've got eight of those in my program. So it's a percentage. That's like most people take that percentage from their audience working with them. And I don't think I've done, I might have done three reels total, if that. Um, I just post basically mostly threads thoughts and I just post them on the feed. But people like the way I speak about it and they're like, oh yeah, that's me. Because I'm very clear on what are the problems that people are struggling with? How can I help them? What is the solution? Why it's affecting their business if they don't get it right? Yeah. But most people don't have that with clients. It's like like you said, dance along to a TikTok um, like noise, pointing at bubbles saying why creating is important. No one's working with you because of that. To go from like you dancing and pointing at a sign to spending £200 a month with you, that's a big fucking jump for someone to make. Whereas like sharing ideas isn't. If you think about it as well, right, people should go aiming for virality. Yes, it gets more eyes on you. And I think like mm. doing some things that are maybe going to get more eyes on occasionally in the entertainment stuff, if it's your style, fine. Yeah. But who are the people you are more likely going to be attracting? The people I follow that go viral are when I'm doom scrolling. So you're encouraging mm. doom scrollers. You're not encouraging people committed to potentially buy your product. You're committing to people mm-hmm. that are already just there for a bit of entertainment and sodden off. So what I tend to find, especially, and this is in my world, I deal with a lot of coaches. My taglines help coaches beat imposter syndrome by getting better results for the clients. I think there's a parallel to coaches wanting um, people that are overweight and unhappy about this. These are the, not the people. They are people that doom scroll because we all do it. But these mm. aren't the people that are um going to be liking sharing your posts if they're unhappy about the body weight they're probably not going to share their coaches post on the feed because it, it mm. shows showcasing insecurity i've had coaches join my program that have never liked or shared yeah. or interacted with most of my clients yeah yeah they've consumed it in the background and i've watched mm-hmm. your post every day and i'm like i didn't yeah. even know you existed until you signed yeah up. yeah and it's like you're in my head like i didn't know you'd ever seen me yeah. i had to search your name on instagram to find out who you were yeah all and we're time. seeing that. We're seeing. I think we're seeing that more and more and more. It's not just in the coaching realm. I, I, I think it links into what you were saying earlier on about people being more comfortable and not uh, as used to the hard work. Um, where coaches are now more certainly in my space, um, not my space, but my <laughs> section of the uh, media. Yeah. Um, where people will happily buy a business coach because they're not expected to know about business. But their mm. ego and this whole reaction video trend on Instagram where people are so scared to be wrong in the fitness space, they don't like admitting they're getting help learning about the stuff that's supposed to be their job. They feel that they need to be, even though they've been at PT three months, they need to mm. know everything. So they don't jump in with this. And then I started going, mm. is this just a fitness thing? And then I started looking. I'm on Facebook groups. And I interact with a few of them just to help out. And I went on the Hong Kong expat uh, Facebook page totally different and someone asked um i saw another one today which is really creepy but I'll, I'll say both of them the first the non-creepy one was could somebody recommend a restaurant on kowloon side that does x food from anonymous member i'm like why do you need to be anonymous to ask for dinner recommendations mm. what's the worst that could happen if someone knew your name was susan and i saw another <laughs> one today of someone taking a photo of a guy crossing the road going i really fancy this guy if, if anyone knows him it's really creepy could you um, could you let them know I'm interested? And the top comment was, you're an anonymous user. Even if I wanted to do this, how could I <laughs> let them know you're interested? Are you yeah. seeing now that more people are so scared of putting themselves out there compared to they were maybe five, ten years ago, mm. that you just don't take the leap at all? They stay so yeah, definitely. in that comfort zone. Yeah. And I think people will do the half work and then complain it's not working. When like, that's when you'll get coaches. I'm like, I post every single day. Yeah, but if we go through your post, it's very generic. It's not speaking to anyone. It's not your opinion. There's nothing authentic. It's why why consistency is important. Like no one's spending money with someone because of like a, a generic post about consistency being important. And how has that helped them in any sort of way? How is that your unique view on that thing? But coaches will hide behind that because it's scary to share your ideas. And this is something I'll say to coaches. Like 
that it takes a vulnerability to go, I've spent loads of hours on this idea and this frame for how I think about things. And like, this is how I get people to see this about fat loss. And if I spent all this time on it and then I put it out there and no one likes it, I feel like I've wasted my time. So like there is definitely a, oh, it's uncomfortable to share ideas and no one likes. But like you said, no one's liking my Instagram comments in terms of nutrition clients. Like no one's liking my pictures. No one's liking my posts or anything. But clients are coming in and saying, oh yeah, it's like you're living in my head. You're speaking about this stuff like no one else. I've done stuff before, but it was all just about like calories and macros. It's never stopped me from emotionally eating. Like, can I work with you? They've never liked a post. So if I optimize my content, Yes, I might get more likes, but I don't get any fucking clients. If I optimize it for having the best ideas and sharing those, um, like I've come on today with analogies for things, for comparisons, with ideas that I've already kind of thought about and built out. So like doing a, a podcast about this stuff for two hours is not an issue for me, but for some people it really would be because they're like, yeah, fat loss, well, it comes down to calories in versus calories out. Yeah, thank you. That's really unique. Wonderful. Thank you. I have no idea. Can I please, can I give you 300 pounds? Like, it just doesn't work. And like my, I'm probably pissing people off that listen now, but like that's my communication style is it's incredibly sarcastic Me too. from a compassionate place because like I really want people to do well. The whole point of my business is get coaches to get out their own way so they share better ideas because they are there. They've just not had time with them. And that's what's going to change the industry because there is a lot of black and white thinking, a lot of very poor ideas in the industry at the moment that aren't helping people. And then the good coaches don't necessarily get the clients because they've not found a way of sharing their ideas and constantly building them. Yeah. So I work with some incredible coaches in the industry who, when they get free time and put stuff out, it's so powerful. And people are like, wow, yeah, I've got to work with you because I can relate to you more than anyone else. Yeah. I I was speaking to a young coach uh, today who's, um, he might listen to this. So I, 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 and he's he's a, he's a nice lad, but he's he he's focused very heavily on the social media aspect more than necessarily the educational space. He's smarter than I was at his age by a country mm-hmm. mile. Um, and he did a video today about um, low calorie diets and the effects of them. And I had a little bit of advice as a person in the industry. I was like, but I DM'd him because I knew comments could come across like combative, and people want mm-hmm. to be the expert. And the first thing he said was, "Thank you for not making this like aggressive." And like hmm. that, we were you were going to tell me I'm wrong, and I'm just like, is that what young coaches are fearing these days? Because if they do something wrong, and I saw this with one of my students, he posted a great video about an incline bicep curl, right? How it will train your arms, um, but also it will be a loaded stretch of the pec, help you get into more shoulder extension, which might help your pressing range of motion and your pec development in future phases. The problem was, in a 15-second video about bicep curls, he said, the best pec exercise you're not doing is the hook. People listened to the first three seconds. It went ballistic people the some very big trolley accounts that you probably would have heard of that i won't name on here did reaction videos of him and i'm like no one's gone oh i started working with this coach and i lost 20 kilos and then i did a bicep curl instead of a dumbbell press and i gained 20 kilos back like it's never happened it doesn't fucking matter but we've created this industry where people are so scared to share their ideas because it's not just the fear of them not being sure of their ideas which always is going to be the case we now have the fear of Mm. ridicule which is a brand new problem which is 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 totally awful i'll get feel free to give your take on that but the question i had a follow-up from you there with people is is the niche the problem because people will go i don't have authentic content it's because i don't understand my niche it it can be and because niche isn't just I work with busy professionals that are aged this to this, like everyone kind of thinks it is. Niche is everything from like cultural references to tone of voice to sense of humor, all those sorts of things. So sometimes your content is physiologically, like educationally, evidence-based. It's all correct, but it doesn't land because it's not authentic to you. But then what is authentic to you isn't with the kind of clients that you work with. So like a lot of my cultural references, even though I'm only 29 because of my family and stuff, they're all quite old in terms of music, TV, film, that sort of thing. So if I make those references, I generally work with people who are in their kind of 30s to 50s and women. So I can make references. I can be authentically myself because I know those sorts of people have a similar sense of humor to me. So everything is aligned. It's not just about like, what is your goal? Oh, you want to like lose fat and you've been doing Slimming World all your life, which is what people typically think of as the niche is 
you've got that diet culture mindset. You want to get rid of it. That's who my niche is. My niche is for like those kind of women in those sorts of jobs who have got the kind of lifestyle, but they've got that sense of humor. I understand their, like I could tell you what their day looks like. I could tell you what they're thinking at any given time. Like that's, that's niche, but then that aligns with who I am as a person, how I um, communicate ideas, the platforms that I want to use, how I want to do it, all of those sorts of things. So niche comes into it, but I don't think it's just niche and it's certainly not people's like very narrow view of what a niche is i agree with that i think a niche becomes part of the niche is you right like there's a lot of it for me there's a lot of education companies out there right the information you'll get will probably be relatively similar but the same thing the difference is not necessarily my knowledge it might be but Hmm. it's probably you like me you resonate with me you like my style you like the way i talk you may Hmm. be into a pro wrestling james bond and rugby and you go well i like to learn about thyroid but i also like to talk about the rock you know like Mm. it's that stuff and i get a lot of coaches saying that that it's their niche and then you look at, like how long you've been a coach three years i'm like you don't even need to worry about a niche yet you haven't worked with mm. enough people to have an understanding of what niche you even want to do but what you do yeah. need to do especially online is understand the content versus pain points and, mm. and that's tri- challenging but i'll see people go say to me uh oh i don't know my niche well enough and then i'll go on their page and it'll be like why you should use straps on deadlifts this is what BMI is. And I'm like, no one, no one went, oh, do you know what? I didn't realize I wanted a fat loss coach, but then I found out what BMI was. Yeah. And then I'm like, it's like, what do they want? They want to look good in the gym. Yeah, yeah. They want to be wearing a bikini on the beach. They want the partner to fancy him again. They want to look down the shower and see the penis. Whatever mm. it is, that's the thing you need to attract for. It's not, yeah. this is how a leg curl works. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's so true. And like, there's often like a scattergun. I used to be guilty of this because of my background in nutrition. There are so many topics that I can talk about. It's kind of like, where do I start? Mm. I work with some really good coaches where it's like, you're sharing information that's not all relevant to one person. So like that example you gave, like even if someone did care about their BMI and I work with, I have consultations in some of my roles where it's like, oh, I, I'm aware my BMI is too high and we have to have that conversation. Yeah. But if they care about the BMI, they're fucking not deadlifting heavy enough to care about straps anyway. So why are you putting out those two bits of information? Yeah. Either one could be relevant, but they're never re- relevant together. So like I've got, I work with a coach actually, and she's amazing. She's doing a PhD in like relationship with food, alcohol dependence and stuff like really cool research in women. And I always make the joke because like a few months ago, she was posting about like why creatine is important for the gym. And I was just like, but that's not your people. That's not what you're doing. Like it's true. It might be part of your recommendations or your coaching, there's a hundred reasons why they might use creatine for various different things, but like, that's not what's going to separate you from other coaches. So like, you don't need to be posting about just because it's true. doesn't mean that you should be sticking it on your Instagram feed. Yes. So what do people need to know about content to get out of their own heads? Cause they, they, I think I see a lot of coaches procrastinate on content. So what would mm. help them do it? I think spending more time thinking about analogies and metaphors that help people. And there are some coaches that do this, in a way that I think is a little bit overdone, but the coaches with huge followings that, you know how people will kind of have like, oh, this is your calories over the week and they've got like different cups of water. And if you do this and do this and like, I think that's a bit overdone, but like that always gets really good engagement. Now don't go and do this because it's got engagement for the people, but that's an example where this is a topic that people are struggling with, but I'm not explaining it in a science way. I'm letting them see it visually. This is what it looks like. This is how you can change it. That's going to work for you. So I think analogies and metaphors are really underused by coaches, but they're actually an incredibly powerful communication tool because we learn through stories. Like as a species, that's how we kind of communicate anyway. How many coaches are really communicating stories properly? And like the story, even the story of like, this is where you're going wrong. So for me with emotional eating, I know the kind of story where the two o'clock Snickers thing where like, oh, I need a sugar brush. Like that's giving you no energy. That's not why you're having it. You're having it because you've worked for six hours nonstop. You had a working lunch where you were eating a sandwich and then trying to type an angry email to Deborah accounts with one hand. And then you've not had a break. You're really tired. That's uncomfortable. You're seeking something for comfort. So you have some sugar. That's fine. But if you understand why, you can maybe put a break in there or something else. And telling people that story of them going, oh shit, yeah, that is me. I could just say, Oh, instead of having that, why don't you have a break or why don't you have something that's high protein and a piece of fruit? 
It's exactly the same content, but one of them's going like, don't tell me what to do. And one of them's going, oh my God, that's me. Like, that's what I do every single day. You're so right. And that's just one example where if you can break down the problems they have, but really communicate it in a way where like, yes, that is me. I resonate with that through stories, through analogies, through metaphors, through comparisons, through various references. That's really helpful. But when coaches don't have time to think of what those things are, so what are my unique mechanisms? What are my like ways of doing this differently to everyone else? How do I explain this is what you're doing and why you're doing it? It's really, it's really difficult. I did one with a, co- a client of a day I had a conversation and then I spent about an hour and a half afterwards crafting out something that kind of explained it. So um, just to go off on a tangent, it was kind of emotional eating and she overate loads of ice cream because she was really stressed about a, a medical appointment coming up. And then before she messaged me, she was going to go and do it again the next day because she had, she was feeling stressed about the fact that she'd gone off what she intended to do with her food. So then I created this kind of two cycle analogy where the first cycle is we want to interrupt the, when I'm stressed, I eat. But then the second cycle is when I eat, I then feel stressed and eat again. So like there's multiple opportunities for us to interrupt that either by the initial one where we work on stress coping and the second one where we work on compassion when you've kind of fucked up how do you speak to yourself what do you do after that and like that analogy was like yeah that's what I do every single time Mm. but I could have just said like oh next time maybe try not to do this it might it might have worked but it probably wouldn't yeah but she's now thought about oh yeah this this is me with the two cycles again and that's going to help her think about it and change it yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of coaches often overthink their content as well because they spend too much time, one, scared of other coaches ripping them apart, and two, spend mm-hmm. time looking at other coaches. And the thing yeah. I always look at is like, right, do you know more than your client? Yes. Then, you don't, you, then yeah. you don't need to know more than me. You know, like, you just need to know more than Susan from accounting. And mm-hmm. the other thing is, like, people are so worried about putting out content. Like, when was the last time you went on someone's Instagram and scrolled for ages? That piece of content Mm. will disappear in a week. Your stories will disappear in a day. So Mm. just put stuff out. If you're a new person with very few followers, no one's watching your page anyway. Mm. Just get the reps. If you did three bits of content a day for a year and you were a rubbish editor and rubbish at filming, you would be better after a year than the person who's brilliant at it but only post once a week. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think that's probably something we've not even spoke about. It's like, how many reps are you doing? So for me, like those reps weren't always on social media. I've done so many different roles. It's kind of scary that I've only had like a seven year career. Like I've got so much different experience. I've worked in pretty much every sport apart from like tiddlywinks. I've worked with every <laughs> single age group, every from like people working at uh, like spec savers all the way to CEOs, like with seven, eight figure companies. So like I've got loads of context to then be able to give information. Whereas if I'm not, I don't have exposure to that. So we spoke kind of off camera about like saying yes to lots of opportunities. A lot of coaches coming back to your point, go very narrow, very early. Yeah. Um, when I did my master's, funny enough, I did a sports nutrition master's at Loughborough and we got asked who wants to work with elite athletes and everyone put their hand up. And there's kind of like a snobbery around like, I don't want to work with this sort of person because they're not, they don't want to work this way or they're not going to be good clients or whatever. I think that's bollocks. I think you should work with everyone because yeah. you get, you get good experience and there's that i mean i'm glad i worked with athletes because it's a huge misconception because depending on the sport you get some athletes that are a fucking nightmare i used to work a lot you mentioned rugby earlier men's and women's rugby at decent level like championship men's level women's premiership some of the loosest people you've ever met like ego, on the piss. Egos, egos as well that you've got to deal yeah. with which oh 100 yeah in. Leo, no team, team sports world, right? i'm good enough that i don't have to think about this sort of thing yeah because it's a skill sport and i'm fucking great at it and then all the way to like when you're working in triathlon for example they're obsessed with it so they want to know like the real tiny details the one percenters like i've spent 15 grand on my bike how can i make myself a little bit better on it like that sort of thing so the more experiences you've got different sports different types of people different age groups across anything like even the fitz gem pop it's so important hmm. I, I i i couldn't agree more i think this is what 
One of the biggest advantages I've had from a career perspective is that I was forced to work with these kind of people. There was almost like a running joke when I was at UP that I was given the clients that no one else wanted. So I was given the people with scope. Yeah. Like if a beautiful blonde came in, it would go to um, Mark Abercrombie and Fitch looking trainer Luke. If a big Jack guy <laughs> came in, it would go to our manager. Then you see someone with like a diabetic needle in an arm and I heart veganism mm. dragging their foot in like this. And I'm like, <laughs> I wouldn't even have to ask. You're here for me, right? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It gave me abilities and skill sets to work with different people. And when it came to a niche later down the line, it was much easier because I worked with a lot of people and mm. I could not only decide who I like working with, who I could help best, but also I had the ability. If I, let's say I came straight out and I wanted to work with athletes and you start working with athletes and you're good at it. What happens mm. when that athlete retires from the sport, priorities change, pick up an injury, develop an autoimmune condition? Do you just give up that client now because you've never worked with anybody else? And I also think gen pop clients are actually more rewarding in a lot of ways. Like if you 100%. work with an athlete or a bodybuilder, right, and you get them in shape and you do a good job, don't wrong, it's great and it's for your, good for your social media, but they're basically going to go, thanks, mate, you're one of many coaches. They probably had a coach before you and they'll have coaches after you. Gen pop, you may have done something, they may have gone out of pain they've had for 20 years. They may have never thought they would even have a flat stomach, let alone a set of abs. When you give them that, they are so unbelievably grateful. Their life has changed. It is way more powerful. Getting somebody, mm. an insulin-dependent type 2 diabetic, off insulin is more life-changing than getting someone to the eighth show when they've done seven before with seven different coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Um, and you, you learn more about your role. Because like those kind of very extreme examples you gave, I used to work in weight-making sport, and towards the end of like, when you're coming to make and weight, it's very prescriptive on my end. Like, this is how much you need to eat. We need to think about your fiber. We need to think about soul. We need to think about fluids, that sort of stuff. That's what most people want. Most nutritionists want more control, I think, or most coaches want control. I One of my biggest pet peeves is like, oh, I gave them calories and macros and they didn't stick to the plan. So yeah. it's kind of their fault. Like, don't, you shouldn't be, maybe you shouldn't be using it with those people. But like, and like people won't lose weight and the coach will just say, right, we're going to reduce your calories in like this, this week and increase your steps and whatever, like, and just treat people like kind of calculators and try and make it as easy as possible. Whereas you're working with people, therefore the psychology involved, like get good at that. The way, one of the ways you get good at that one is through education, reading, learning. One is exposure to lots of different weird people. And like, you find out what makes people tick. One of my best jobs at the moment, which I, I say best jobs, I don't particularly enjoy it necessarily is the job that I've got in telehealth, the one I spoke about. So like people who have nutrition consultations as part of their private medical. Um, I say I don't like it, I do enjoy it. Um, but they're people that wouldn't be engaged in the fitness industry. They wouldn't be paying money for services. They're not paying £200 a month for coaching. Because that is, we forget that that's a very specific type of person, but they still want help. So their attitude, mindset, relationship with food, how they approach eating, very, very different to anything you'd see in the industry. So my coaching has to look very different. My tools that I'm using out my toolkit are very different to someone who's a private client of mine paying lots of money because it has to be. So I have people that are like, oh, I want to lose weight. Yeah, but I'm not going to stop drinking four bottles of wine at the weekend. And that's genuine conversations that I have. A fitness in, like imagine someone in the fitness industry having that conversation. They'd be like, well, just don't. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So like, the, yeah, the more experience you can get, the better, the better your ideas I have so many conversations a week, so it's almost impossible for me to not have good ideas because I'm testing them all the time. And I'll make these analogies. Oh, that landed, that didn't. Yeah, I'll try it again in a different way next time. So, yeah, for young coaches or coaches early on in their career, get as much varied experience as possible. I, I agree with that so much. And I also think as well, don't let other people influence you about what you should and what you shouldn't do. Like, mm -hmm. I, I've had two two great examples of this. The, so, someone on 1,200 calories or 600 calories, arbitrary number, that is too low. And whenever I ask a coach to find what, why it's too low, I've never gotten a good answer for this. Because it's because, oh, because coach said this. Well, is there any symptoms of this? That there are any signs that they're too low? No. Okay. Right. So why is it too low? And it's like, don't be wrong. You shouldn't be putting everyone on 800 calories and let them grind out for six months. Yeah. But sometimes if you've got an end goal that you need to push to, you, we, we as an industry like to project our problems with food, with people we are doing 20,000 steps and training five days a week onto our inactive clients. And mm. the big, we've had this thing, this rise in people talking about emotional eating issues. I have sympathy and empathy for anyone with an eating disorder. I really do. Mm. But most people, 
There's like 700 odd thousand people with eating disorders as well, which is far too many. There's about 2.5 billion people that are overweight. So most people need more structure, right? They, are, they, they need to eat less crisps. They're not scared of crisps. And mm. we need to not, like, because somebody else says, you follow this Instagram page and they say that's bad. So you should learn when that's bad or when that's not and be able to auto-regulate mm. that. Same thing with meal yeah, plans. Yeah. The other example is meal plans don't teach you anything. And I'm like, they teach you structure. They teach you portion control. They teach you how a day looks. They teach you how to manage your energy. Mm-hmm. They teach you what foods resonate with you and what not. The yeah. coach that will tell me meal plans don't teach you anything will also give training plans. No one is giving you a set of total tonnage and going, pick the exercise <laughs> you want because I don't want to be yeah, you know, yeah. in, inaccessible with exercise selection. And yeah. you wouldn't say training plans don't teach you anything. So like, mm. don't get caught up in that mentality. Yeah, context matters like 100 percent. i could think of so many good examples where like people i would make recommendations that fly in the face of what everyone says tracking's a really good one isn't it it's a really good example where some people so you get the other side where it's like if everyone just tracked they'll be able to lose weight easy you've obviously not worked with people though because i see people who mm-hmm. track their food as soon as it goes red on my fitness pal they freak the fuck out and eat another three thousand calories yes i can give them more structure and more things if i take away my fitness pal they'll eat better does it matter? I see people that eat beyond fullness because my fitness pal says they've got 300 calories left, so they're just going to keep eating. Yeah. I've seen people like who we take tracking away, they've not learned anything, they go back to their old eating habits. So putting tracking in didn't help, even though they think that's the answer. Um, the example I always give is like Luke said sport is the example I love giving. Most people would say, that, oh, it's not good for you because it's sugar and water and it's bad and like, oh my God, it's the worst thing ever. Um, Tim Spector would probably lose his head if anyone ever recommended it. I used to work in triathlon um, very early in my career with some athletes. I had a 19-year-old and she'd had nine stress fractures at the age of 19 because of chronic low energy availability, relative energy deficiency, all those sorts of things. I can make an unbelievable case for Luke State Sport being a health drink. Yeah. It's a very easy way of getting 30 grams of carbs and during training. So, But for like, if I'm an overweight type 2 diabetic who goes to work and comes home and sits in front of the TV, it's not a good choice. Like, How can you tell me that context does not matter for nutrition? 100%. On the topic of nutrition, from a productivity mm-hmm. standpoint, what nutrition tips would you mm. give someone to feel more energy and more focus? Um, good question. For coaches, you should be doing all the things that matter anyway. I think the only thing that's going to get in the way of people in the fitness industry is the amount of calories, genuinely, is coaches that try and get super lean and super low calorie chronically. So if you're more obsessed with photo shoots than you are with your business, you're going to struggle for cognitive clarity. Everything else is around like staying hydrated, eating a variety of fruit and veg, eating enough plants. Um, way too many coaches care about things like nootropics before they've even figured out any of the actual productivity stuff. So like you can't caffeine and L-theanine in your way out of a fucking dreadful task management system, for example. So <laughs> stop trying. So that would probably be my main advice is don't worry about it too much. Even like exercise, the literature on it's a bit mixed really. Again, because these things are so, so difficult to study. So being fitter seems to be better for your cognitive output, but then the like acute exercise, the effects of acute exercise on cognitive output immediately afterwards is a bit mixed. Mm. But if you think how many variables you've got to try and control around like, intensity, um, modality, all those sorts of things, and then you've got to try and assess cognitive function, which is difficult to do in a, a way that's ecologically valid. It's basically a minefield. So um yeah, eat like a normal person, eat a balanced diet, all the kind of crap we normally tell people, that's going to get you enough. And then stop trying to optimize it for productivity and do stuff that matters instead. Yeah, I, I, and there's too many variables with that, right, as well, right? Like, does your nutrition match your training? So you can have the right training cycle that's great for productivity, but if you're in that deficit, you might need to bring that training volume down or increase the food. And in the same exactly. way, way we said context matters. It's like, you know, we almost like a hunting and farming season. You eat this in, we're not saying because because there will be people that do this they go oh if i if i care about my business more i should never diet i'm like good luck mm. getting clients if you've never gone through the process yourself so it's like yeah if you know you're in a grindy time like i had a student of mine martin is in the middle of two shows he's grinding he's keeping the business flow he's doing well in some ways he's doing better because Clients are following the meal plans better because they see him mm-hmm. as someone that's inspirational. They're not going to give as many excuses because they're like, well, he's doing harder than I am. He's not going to get away with, I didn't feel like it today. Yeah. But he knows his energy is going to be lacking for these next few weeks until those shows come in place. 
Then mm-hmm. who comes up and it changes it. And then that's that periodization again that we spoke about right, yeah. right back at the start. Um, yeah. So you mentioned smart subs. Mm-hmm. Because people are going to want to hear this, even if they haven't sorted their shit out. What are your go-tos and why? Caffeine. Mm-hmm. Because caffeine is really well evidenced for it. Uh, L-theanine is very, very occasionally because it seems to help with that kind of balance of like you get the focus, but without the really high anxiety that comes with caffeine. So I sometimes we'll pair them. Um, and then genuinely, honestly, hand on heart, nothing else. Because I, like, I, go I don't need them. I don't need them. I stretch my work in a way where you don't need them. I, I think I think that you've got these. I I would agree with you in those two. You can play around with things like if you if, if you can get your hands on. I'm not saying people take these, but things like modafinil, things like oh yeah, um, nicotine. But we've got to think of like yes. the 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 addictive nature of nicotine mm. and the yeah. even, though, even though modafinil is not addictive, we've also got to understand that here that um, if we're overdoing stimulants, and this is supposed the case for caffeine too, is caffeine mm-hmm. good for you? Uh, Yes, it's a thermogenic. It's a antioxidant. Mm-hmm. It's a, you know to a degree anti-inflammatory. But I'm going to come back to that point. It can help with focus and drive. But if you're chronically stressed, underslept, poor nutrition, you're just adding to that stress cup, and now it's overflowing. Mm-hmm. So all those benefits yeah. are not now negated. And yeah. that inflammatory thing I said I come back to. If you're overstressed, it's going to come back and bite mm, you on the matter. ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Theanine yeah. is interesting because theanine is a precursor to GABA in the brain. Mm-hmm. So like GABA supplements are particularly useless, but theanine is a precursor to GABA which can help calm you down and be able to maybe, maybe not if you're taking it with caffeine to take the edge off it, but if you're taking theanine before bed, mm-hmm. could allow you to get into more states of parasympathetic drive and allow you to have more of those quiet thinking times. Yeah. I personally, I've been intrigued to get your take on this because whenever I say I've got ADHD, I have to purposely say the medicated kind and not mm-hmm. the self-diagnosed Instagram kind. Uh, <laughs> and whenever you put, and again, I know it's not totally research back, but I think it's quite a useful tool. You ever put someone through a Braverman assessment? Mm. Everyone's GABA deficient. And I wonder, is ADHD actually on the rise, or are people just more distracted? They're more dopamine-driven. They've, they're, they're hugely GABA deficient, and they just need to learn how to calm the fuck down, and this is why they can't focus. Do you think ADHD is actually on the rise, or do you think there's something else going on? It's a great question, and it's probably well above my pay grade. Um, I think it's a fascinating one where you do get the two sides where is it now being diagnosed more than ever, and are people trying to cash in on that fact, potentially? But then on the flip side, was it always more prevalent than we thought, and it was just massively it's mismanaged an awareness. and misdiagnosed? Mm. 100%. Yeah, in the same way that other mental health, I say other because it's not mental health, but mental health conditions where people say depression, um, is it on the rise? No, we just are we identifying it more, and it's better diagnosed potentially um a, a cool example with the depression one is i went to at roy sutherland's conference jonathan height the psychologist sociologist yeah, yeah. was talking about um, social media use in children and we've seen like a huge increase in self-harm um in like 10 to 12 year olds because of social media use. and it it literally went like this with uh, the smartphone and with social media and someone said like oh are we just seeing like are we seeing more mental health stuff because we're diagnosing it? And it was like suicide's gone up. So you cannot explain that in any other way other than this seems to be like a huge trend between. So um, coming back to your question, I I honestly don't know. Um, But again, like ADHD sometimes doesn't mean medication, does it? Sometimes it just means permission for this person, particularly for coaches. I think it's really, really relevant. Permission for you to try working less, working different times, working different days, playing around with your schedule. Because if you think if you think you might have it, but you've not got it diagnosed, you're probably just going to ignore what your brain is telling you, really flog it and then feel like shit. So actually, sometimes that conversation can be useful, even if you're not exploring medication. Because I know people are like, oh, why would you try and get a diagnosis unless you want medication? As if it's medicated or nothing. When actually, sometimes it's just like, oh, now I know this, I have my own internal permission to to shift things around and play around with it and not work all the time. It's a weight off, off your shoulders as well. I was, at, exactly. I, I was at, uh, basically uh, diagnosed at 30. And mm-hmm. um, for me, it was like the, the, the things like it's, it, and then this is how I know that it, that it was a case. It's not just me like seeing it on Instagram. Going, oh, I might have a bit of that because I can't focus. 
Because mm. as a kid, I was losing things every week. And I used to get so frustrated at people telling me, like, how do you keep losing stuff? It's like, oh, I, I feel bad already that I've lost my rugby boots three times yeah. in a month. And I was given the, you have so much potential, but, and you can't focus and you're agitated. And when I got that diagnosis, it wasn't a excuse to be lazy. Like, oh, I got ADHD, mm. so don't expect anything from me. It's like, oh, this is the reason why I'm not necessarily tidy. This is the reason, like, okay, I, did, I still need to work on this shit, but I'm not a fuck up. And that takes mm. so much stress off. And like regards to medication, yes, I am medicated. Do I take it regularly? No. There are two reasons for that. Mm. I have ADHD and I forget to take my meds, <laughs> which is the most <laughs> ADHD sentence I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. But the other reason is like, and again, this comes back to auto-regulation thing. Will this help me focus? Yes. But I'm going through a divorce. I'm running a business. I have multiple other stresses on my plate. Like I said about caffeine, do I want to add a stimulant on top of that? Because I ain't giving mm. up coffee to make room for biobanks, right? So yeah. it's it's like, okay, I will use it when I need it. If I don't need it, I will find other ways. And often it's the opposite mm-hmm. of a stimulant to, yeah. to do that. Um, mm-hmm. So I've got two final questions for you. I could go on to this for ages, but I am aware that your bladder so. might not be able to hold uh, <laughs> and you need to shoot by three o'clock. So yeah. what, what are your top three productivity tips that we haven't covered, or if you haven't been clear on them, but so coach now going, I'm all over the place. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. keep my head above water, but just barely, it just feels like chaos. What yeah. would be the top three things you'd advise them? I think you have to build some sort of digital system. So the way that I would tend to do it is you need to get things down to zero. I'm a big fan of this. So like people might have heard of like getting inbox zero with their emails. I'm a big fan of doing that. And then like things like their desktop downloads, folders, that sort of shit. One, our last questions, like how many Chrome tabs do you have? How many documents are there in your downloads, in your desktop? Uh, how many emails have you got? If your brain is essentially trying to keep tabs on all of these things. And actually, if your your brain is for having ideas, not for holding them. But if you're asking your brain to hold on to everything, then you won't have capacity to do work. You won't have capacity to do ideas or anything like that. So Get those things down to zero. Have a way of filing things so that you know everything is where it needs to be and you could find it within a minute. So like coaches waste hours per year trying to find documents and folders and things because they don't know where they are. Having that in one place makes total sense Mm -hmm. to me. Um, So I will often get coaches to try and think about doing that. Um, And then you need a system to stay on top of that. So some sort of weekly... Daily and weekly recap are really great for coaches. I do, I've do. i been doing like a weekly recap for about four years now. And it just allows you to close loops. So we spoke about why detachment is such an issue for coaches. There are so many open loops open. Oh, I need to reply to that person. Oh, I've got to write this project. Oh, I thought about doing this, but am I going to do it? Don't know. Uh, I had this cool content idea, but I've not written it down. Like that sort of stuff is, it's a mess. So write everything down, go through it each day and say, right, how can I close these loops? You don't have to reply to every message, but... I'm going to add these to my list of things to do tomorrow and then like make sure that I'm constantly taking action on things. I'm capturing everything. So it's not in my brain. It's all down on computer. And then it's just a case of keeping it tidy each day and each week. Um, Cause you know how like when people have a messy desk and they're like, if you tidy it, your head feels clear and all that sort of stuff. You live online and your online system is a fucking mess. Your brain's going to feel the same. If you open it up and it's anxiety inducing, it's hard to get focused on work. Yeah. So getting everything clear, keeping it clear, and then putting at least five hours a week aside for just idea gen. So just for thinking for what are my beliefs? What are my philosophies? I've got a list of my ideas here. How can I merge them? How can I combine them? How can I maybe use some of them to further my learning? So this is like a, a kernel of an idea. How can I like expand it do i need to know more or do i need to think more about it that sort of stuff that's going to make you a better coach because it's either going to give you directed learning because learning for the sake of learning is kind of pointless because your brain's got nothing to map it to whereas if it's like i've already got this idea why can i put it to how can i that attach it to something else that gives you direction for learning which makes your learning better so yeah get everything clear keep everything clear and then spend time thinking yeah I love, I, I love that. And I think one of the, like, the closed loop thing is really, really important. This is why I switched from a daily to-do list to a weekly to-do list. Um, mm-hmm. Because it was like, 
the, I was doing a daily do list and then I would add stuff to it and then I wouldn't finish stuff and then that would be the open loops mm. for the night. Whereas if I had a weekly yeah. do list, if I had a lazy day because I just I had a bad night's sleep or something was going on, that's fine as long as I get stuff done the week. Or if mm. I have a busy end of the week, I can hammer them all on Monday, set, mm-hmm. like knuckle in and do a big day of work and then ch- slight, not chill, but like go on mm. like the basics or bare minimum for the rest of the week. And that was a yeah. big sort of... Um, game changer for me so the last question i ask everybody and i ask this because Mm -hmm. uh everyone will listen to the podcast and you often see these people who they consider experts in a field and they think i am so far from this person and as we said earlier it's idiots all the way up so this question sort of brings it back name one thing that you have changed your mind on oh that's a great question Ooh, could it be on anything anything uh you've really really stumped me there's probably too many things so it's trying to get it down to one um i think and this might be a slightly controversial one and i don't think it's fully i'll give you two actually because i had one that is a bit more fleshed out and one that's not the one that's not fleshed out is not everyone should try and spend more time learning about nutrition hmm and the reason for that, I used to think that everyone should and everyone would be better off if they did. But there's so much information out there now and it's so crap, a lot of it, that I most, most of my work is with people who are really confused about nutrition because they've tried to learn it, but not no one's got the skills, the critical thinking to know, is this person biased? Is this person a good source of information? Yeah. Um, oh, he's he's putting stuff out that kind of sounds sciencey. Yes, he's trying to sell me Zoe for loads of thousands of pounds, but like... <laughs> Maybe it's good information. So, like, I don't think everyone should try and learn loads and loads about nutrition, whereas I used to think they should. Um, my probably less controversial, more recent one was, uh, and I posted about this online the other day, with books, there's this kind of idea that, because I'm so big on learning, um, I don't know if you've seen people say, like, oh, don't read thousands of books. You should read five books and then take action on the five books that you've read. Yeah. I used to think that was the best advice ever. I now think that's utter horseshit. So I think if you're only reading books that are giving you actionable steps that you need to take, you're reading the wrong books. You should be reading books to further your knowledge. Not, I think if you're reading books where you have to take action on them, you're reading self-help books. So you're actually not getting any better at learning. You're not learning anything new. You're learning like pop psych, self-help type stuff rather than information. So it's okay to read thousands of books as long as it's, as long as you're taking information in, you don't need to action every single thing that you read in the book. I like that. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly further flesh that out as well, because I've had similar thoughts. Is that understanding what the purpose of the book you're trying to read is? So some is for general like general knowledge, where it's like, I, let's say, for sake, Bob, I've got, uh, I've gone back and read all the Lyle McDonald books, and I've got the, mm-hmm. the ketogenic guide. I, I'm going to learn from this book a deep, although I've got a pretty good understanding of keto diets anyway, but I'm going to learn some stuff about ketogenic diets by reading this again. Now, I'm not going to mm-hmm. take action on this. I'm not going to put everyone on a keto diet. No. So yeah. I will read that purely for the idea of learning information and, and not about action taking. There are mm-hmm. other books which are completely about action taking. And the thing I would change about that is get out this idea that we have to read front to back cover because that's what we're taught at school. Use more yeah. books like reference guides. If you mm-hmm. read, like, the, the, read the last chapter of an information book and go, does this help me? No, because most books have like a fucking half a book of intro. No, yeah. I don't really need the rest of the book. Am I into it by the second chapter? No, sack it off. Or find the yeah. relevant ideas and find the chapters that are relevant for you and read those bits. Yeah. Or Most books could be fun. tweets, couldn't they? Yeah. yeah. Or read for fun. A novel can teach you yeah. about storytelling. It could teach you about um, how to communicate, how to write. And yeah. that is not an action-taking book. So I think it's like, know what no. it's for. And then yeah. read it accordingly. If it's a book you yeah. need action for, don't read it like a novel. Yeah, absolutely. No. I've read books where I'm like, actually, I didn't want to do anything with that, but they gave me an analogy. There was one the other day where uh, a systems error at Amsterdam Airport meant that they had to destroy 400 squirrels and just chuck them in a big blender for squirrels, basically. And I was just like, this is completely irrelevant to any of my work, but that's a cool story about how if you don't have systems this can be the consequences that's going in an email for the day. So like I've read and without having intention for the reading, I've then got something out of it anyway. So there's no harm in that. So yeah, um, 
read read really widely, read well outside your your sort of scope of practice or your practice generally, but don't feel like you've got to take action on everything. Love yeah, that. most most books could be tweets. You ever read the checklist manifesto? This is one that I always no. give as an example. Oh, mate, it's a very good premise where, like, basically, if we have checklists of things, then we don't miss stuff because humans are prone to error. But it's basically like, oh, I'm a doctor, so we use checklists and like success of this type of surgery went up. And I'm like, oh, that's a really cool story, really interesting. The next 10 chapters are like, and then we tried it in like left bollock removal and the checklist stopped errors there as well. And then the next chapter is just a different type of error that they've saved with checklists. I'm just like, I didn't need to read the rest of this book because you've just kind of told me in the first chapter, checklists are good. Everything else kind of is irrelevant in the book. Yeah, 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 I totally get that. So if people want to learn more about you or want to improve their own productivity, where's the Mm -hmm. best place to find you? Uh, Instagram, probably. Um, I think I'm just at Charlie B. Stone. Threads is where I share a lot of just like what comes into my brain or some of my more developed ideas as well. So either of those two two places are good. Awesome, man. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Likewise, mate. Thanks for having me.